This video is sponsored by Crimson Manifesto, Knuckles OX, and Jelpy. Bardock has begun his journey for better or worse, as without getting much sleep these days, he would of course need to make a stop or two to fuel some of his vices along the way and rest as well as he can while trying to avoid his nightmares. Though from the Legend of the Dragon, he assumes he has time to kill and will surely need it, since if he flies too fast, it's more than possible to miss the little island Grandpa Gohan described to him. This is where our story opens back up, with Bardock in a little dive bar, eyeing the wishing orb while Ashen got a cigarette, marveling at how much bigger it is than the ones he'd seen for a moment on Planet Serial. Hearing this strange utterance from the disguised Saiyan, the bartender asks for clarification, obviously pretty weirded out by the tailed man, whom has returned to a nice and manageable buzz state. Helping him to wave this off and ask some questions about the island he's looking for, though he doesn't get it much worth his time. Meaning in the end, he just has to fly slowly across the ocean near Mount Pauzu while searching out his target, taking nearly a full day and burning off his drinks in the process before he catches a sight of Pink and so eagerly zoom towards the tiny remote island. Finally arriving at this Roshi's place as Grandpa Gohan called him, Bardock touches down, able to admire the seclusion the little hideaway offered now that he lived among Earthlings for a short time, though this wasn't his main concern at the moment, so he calls out, wanting to know if the pink house actually has any occupants. Finding the answer to be yes, as hesitantly, they reveal themselves to be a man seemingly older than Gohan himself, along with a strange shelled creature he's never seen before. Bardock even wonders how it tasted before ever considering that this thing may be more than a pet. Meanwhile, Roshi's sensing the bits of evil lingering in Bardock's key is of course weary of him, as he can also feel how vast it is on top of that. Though weirdly, he knows that this stranger almost seems sick in a way. Maybe not physically though, even though the man could obviously use a nap and a good shower. But his power was strangely dampered, and even now, almost like the unripening of a vibrant and fresh fruit, he could see that vast key receding gradually. Obviously intrigued now, the turtle hermit asks his new visitor to state his name and business, but as he's already a tad cranky from sleep deprivation, and the search for his first step in his journey haven't taken so long, Bardock is initially a bit too pushy, with his eyes almost now instantly locking onto the Dragon Ball worn around the old man's neck, with the simple answer that this is his prize, and he'd like the old man to hand it over immediately. However, he rather bullheadedly decides not to mention the name of Gohan or is entrusting the Scar Sand with this mission in the first place. Able to assume this unknown quantity at least knows the legend of the Dragon Balls to want them, Roshi cannot afford to hand it over without a fight, and so much like Grandpa Gohan while staring down two Uzaru he knew full well he could not hope to defeat, the old man assumes a fighting stance, ready to defend the Dragon Ball of his life, while urging the creature besides him known as Turtle to run for it and save himself, causing the reptile to worriedly whimper for his friend to be careful while slowly booking it towards the water. Bardock is more so dealing with the feeling of respect that solicits out of him once again. This kind of gumption was impressive when the first old timer he met here did it, and darn it if it's still not pretty cool. And so finally, Bardock remembers his manners, asking himself what Gine would do in this situation, before raising his hands and asserting he is not here to fight, while introducing himself awkwardly for really the first time as Bruce Chun, even deciding to go with Grandpa Gohan's full life for now just until he can ascertain if this old man will be on his side or not too. Now that he has a story that at least makes some sense, Roshi can relax a bit, assured in the knowledge that his star pupil wouldn't send anyone his way who meant him under the world harm. Instead, being rather uplifted by the idea that the man had gone on to live a good life and made a family, at least so this stranger claims, even being blessed with a powerful son-in-law. However, Master Roshi is no fool, and this tale simply doesn't add up as well as Gohan would have probably liked. Though in his defense, he really hadn't expected or intended Bardock to utilize his cover story with Roshi, hoping he'd know to trust those who the old man himself trusts. As such, even with the knowledge that this man is meant to be a friend, and apparently even a relative via Jackie Chun, Roshi refuses to give up the Dragon Ball, just in case, thanking Bardock for stopping by before trying to shoo him off. Of course, not taking no for an answer, Bardock insists on staying until Master Roshi agrees to give the ball up. And sadly, Roshi for the first time in a long time is reminded what it's like to not be the strongest on the planet, as he can't force him to leave. So instead, the hermit devises a plan to trick him and test his reasons for coming here all in one go. Continuing about his day as normal, even with the intrusion of this Bruce Chun on his piece, eventually leading him to trying to enjoy his exercise videos in peace while having a few beers, ignoring Bardock's constant request to reconsider about the Dragon Ball, or questions if the geezer really sat here all day just watching scantily clad women, as well as requests for a brew of his own. Eventually, the old man springs this trap, as he slams down a full sick pack all in his lonesome, acting as if he can't hold his liquor, clumsily moving about the room and slurring his words while berating Bardock in an attempt to shoo him out the house once again. This rudeness has the desired effect, as sick of playing nice, Bardock becomes emboldened to just steal from the old man, this is a far easier and lesser crime than murder in his eyes, and so he smugly reaches out to snatch a 3 star ball with a simple, sorry old timer. As the discard saying advances, Roshi suddenly lurches nearly out of sight drunkenly, before stumbling headlong into Bardock's chest, causing the tailed man to recoil in shock, as this 
decrepit old earthling is a lot more solved than he anticipated. Just as this thought forms, Roshi continues to press his lock, using his advantage in a lower center of gravity to quickly sweep Bardock's legs off from under him twice, bringing him to kneel and cutting him down to a more manageable size for the old man. With Bardock in this vulnerable position, Roshi makes a formation with his arms like he's holding a barrel and begins rolling Bardock's head around roughly through the proverbial pot before suddenly wrapping himself around the taller man's waist and lofting him into the air. He then suddenly goes rolling to unleash double kicks that cause the Saiyan to spin in midair before the old man uses his fingers to attempt at grabbing and crushing Bardock's throat to slim him back down. Only now does the Saiyan renege on his pacifism, meaning to bat this attack away and go for a haymaker to lay the old man flat. However, with perfect anticipation, the drunk old codger catches and creates a lock with his wrists, Pauline tugging them like he's holding a flute while bringing their faces mere inches from one another, the drunken blush on his face simulating that of embarrassment. As Master Roshi then raises his voice to purposely be more feminine, suddenly unsettling Bardock and throwing the rhythm of his already disrupted key off even more, as he's once again confused, therefore leaving a final opening that Roshi uses to put the rest of his force and Bardock's inertia into a finishing blow, driving both his fists into Bardock's stomach and sending the Saiyan flying back through the couch, destroying it, where he ends up flat on his back, with the wind knocked from his lungs. Now stunned, he's received yet another significant blow on this planet, after only having taken them from an Uzara Raditz and an enraged Guinea beforehand, Bardock can't help but reevaluate his choices for a moment, before slamming his fist into the floor of Kame House hard enough to damage it, as he's evidently not learned the lesson. Enraged at this old man's sly tricks, Bardock gets defensive and flips back to his feet, utterly undamaged and unfazed by what the turtle hermit had attempted to use as an all-out gamble to repel this home invader. As the scarred monkey man again orders Roshi to hand the ball over or kiss his ass in this island goodbye. Roshi, however, instead of despairing, now feels emboldened himself. Sure, that near ultimate combo using the fundamentals of drunken boxing had no seeming effect, but what's more, he's also still alive and his assuming opponent and target now has even less resolve to battle in his aura than he did when he arrived. And so, the old man is confident enough in giving Bardock a talking down to, now that he has a much better feel for his key and the kind of man he is. He can now kinda see the kindred spirit Gohan sent his way. And so, he's willing to actually tell Bardock to his face that it's great and all that he's probably the strongest man on this world. But right now, it's very obvious that's all he is, explaining how martial arts serve to equalize gaps in power with hard work and discipline, since what he just did was no trick, just the result of training, making mentions of ideas and concepts that speak to and give words to some of the feelings Bardock has been thinking of and wrestling with that don't really exist in Saiyan society as of late, like the concept of a void or emptiness inside oneself, and filling that up with something more than just bloodshed or the pursuit of money. Sans didn't really have much of that kind of philosophy. His experience as Gine's mate and her likely being the strangest outlier in the last few generations attest to this after all, but it's pretty weird to be on a planet where people mostly like that. So he now thinks he also understands a bit of what Gine felt back on planet Vegeta, as well as the fact that this strangely offers Bardock a modicum of peace. He's not the first person to go through these weird and yucky feelings, and better yet, it seemed like one could survive them and turn out relatively sane, with this being the implication of how Roshi has avoided turning out like Bardock himself has after the King Piccolo War, at least as much as Bardock knows about it so far, maintaining his peace of mind and purpose just as Gohan said was possible. This thankfully sees Bardock willing to share a bit more of his story with Roshi, figuring Gohan must have meant for him to trust him completely after all, as he shares some of his own war stories, both to relate and show off a bit. This bonding is not done without beverages or entertainment either, with their individual vices eventually connecting them to an extent that Bruce Chun could believably be the son of Jackie, as the two also get to just sit and talk earnestly, like Grandpa Gohan had wanted most importantly. And through this developing bond, Roshi convinces Bark to stay at Kami House a little while longer to see if his Turtle School way may be able to help soothe his soul before he continues on his journey, agreeing to relinquish his Dragon Ball if this request is fulfilled. And so, Bardock spends about a week or two bumming it out of Kami House, while continuing to form a connection and friendship to Turtle and Roshi some more, giving the hermit the opportunity to teach some proper martial arts technique now that Bardock is actually showing the interest in it. And in this pursuit, he finds that Bardock has a pretty great affinity to the Drunken Fist, surprisingly. So before their week is up and Bardock departs, Roshi tries to see if mastering this martial arts form in a sober state can soothe his nightmares. Though the lesson of the history of the form and its basis on eight different forms of movement from different drunks seem to go over the younger man's head, it's still pretty clear the general philosophy of freedom and improvisation appeal to Bardock, but it sadly doesn't put an end to the nightmares, with Bardock once again having one that night as he tries to sleep on Master Roshi's couch, with the Saiyan taking this as a sign to continue his journey in the morning. Even though Roshi is a tiny bit melancholy as he hands over the Dragon Ball during their farewells, Bardock surprisingly does not count this as a fruitless effort, as now that they've unofficially become master and student, the Saiyan does at least have someone else he can talk to about the dreams to seek counsel from. And so in the end, when there is nothing left to say or teach in a timely manner, Roshi jokingly decides to let Bardock in on his secret, 
therefore giving him the official blessing to act as Jackie Chun's son, as well as an always good welcome to return to Gama House, should he ever need a peaceful escape again. The two veteran warriors then shake hands as Bardock floats into the air. As he departs, Bardock generally thanks the old man once again, joking that he may send his brats to him one day to train up, since it'd be a pretty great way to get them out of his hair and buy him some alone time with his mate, as he zips off. At Master Roshi's advice, Bardock next travels further west to Mount Frypan, where he meets the Ox King and his still living wife. Like Roshi, the king can somewhat sense the lingering evil in Bardock's key, but as Bardock's power is continuing to diminish the more rest he loses out on, as well as the fact that unbeknownst to the Saiyan, Roshi has helped him to mellow out a bit further, and because he personally sent him here, Ox is actually willing to listen and eventually just hand over the ball without really much of an issue. I mean, why deny somebody who's obviously a fellow student of his master, and a fellow father? Bardock is of course kinda surprised, since he for one, didn't actually mention his kids, so this guy just kinda vibed it out that he was also a dad, and also because he's so trusting. But from Ox's perspective, he really has no reason not to be. After all, his home and family are currently fine, this visitor seems mostly harmless and was even sent to get the Dragon Ball by Master Roshi, and he still doesn't even know if the legend is really true or not, and in all reality, doesn't have anywhere near as honed a sense of ki as Master Roshi had. He's only a tiny bit less acute than Grandpa Gohan's, and overall, Bardock now has less negativity and evil in his key to be sensed, so he realistically has no reason not to just hand over the ball, doing so with a smile to see this envoy of his master on his way, wishing him luck and asking him to give his best regards to the old man next time he sees him, with his guard saying once he gets over his shock, genuinely grateful for this, and thus telling the agreeable ox that he owes him one. Bardock can now go about locating the other Dragon Balls a tiny bit easier, since the trio he currently possesses now glow three times as strong when around another. This next leads Bardock into the biggest city he has been to yet on Earth, as the Dragon Balls are obviously directing him further into civilization, as he arrives in a location called South City, and just so happens to feel the call of the local bars he's passing through. While trying to enjoy his break from the journey with another drink and a smoke, commotion suddenly erupts as a flamboyant man declaring himself a master martial artist and leader of something called Satan Dojo begins making fun of another man, bearing a demeanor Bardock is more than familiar with, being able to spot a fellow killer with just his nose by now, as Bardock took some pride in being able to literally smell bloodlust. However, he also sees no reason to get involved himself. These are earthing problems, and he's supposed to be keeping a low profile. That is until Mr. Satan's student is blown back by the force of the killer's key flaring, resulting in Bardock and a handful of other patrons having their drinks ruined and spilt onto themselves. As he prepares to do away with this boastful man, the killer reveals himself as Tao Pai Pai, the most dangerous man on this earth, thus demanding respect as he loses a sharp beam of energy from his finger. However, before it can hit its mark, the attack is snuffed out in Bardock's hand, leaving nothing but easily wiped away soot and a bit of smoke as he does intervene after all more upset that his break time has been ruined than he is for the trouncing of the week going on in front of him. Of course, believing this is a fluke or trick of the light of some kind, Tao attempts to end this farce by speed blitzing this stranger and simply striking a vital nerve with his tongue. Feeling some audacity will make it clear he is not to be trifled with, but as the gap in their power, even with this weakened Bardock, is still vast, this does nothing but it puts Bardock off as he first assumes this is some form of sexual proposition. Lightly turning down Tao on account of already having an unruly mate and the master assassin not really being Bardock's type at all before just as casually giving him a taste of his own medicine and blowing him flat on his back with the force of his power rising. As he is the one sent slamming into tables and toppling over booze this time, the brother of the crane Hermit quickly recovers in a testament to his spite and his resiliency, able to tell Bardock is holding back and mocking him even if not by how much, and so demands to know who this is. As though unable to sense Ki itself, he can, like Bardock, recognize another killer and their oppressed bloodlust. And this at least tells Tal that he's not only holding something back, but that what he's holding back is utterly inhuman, and thus, his instincts are telling him to back off. Whereas in canon, when faced with this kind of dilemma, usually, Tal has petulantly resisted the obvious truth. Here, I believe he'd be more than willing to stay his hand, simply leaving after Bardock nearly slips up with his real name, before correcting himself and awkwardly drawing out that he is called Bruce Chun. After this encounter, Bardock continues moving ever westward to the next major city, where he finally finds his prize, as the Dragon Balls react strongest near a large building emblazoned with the words Capsule Corp. Entering, Bardock is at first left to marvel at all the machinery and technology mere humans are making, eventually being forced to speak with a receptionist and a security guard to try and explain why he's here. This of course leads to a misunderstanding, and Bardock nearly being forced off the premises, but he decides to fight back without fighting back. Thankful he's learned some new tricks, and using his new drunken fist techniques to wackily let the guards incapacitate themselves before making a break into the company's laughs, in an attempt to find the Dragon Ball himself. Thankfully, the ones he's collected so far continue to act as a good locator device, as this compound is actually pretty big, and more than once or twice he even considers blowing it up to make the search easier. But eventually, Bardock stumbles upon the personal lab of Dr. Briefs, where the old man somewhat anticlimactically happily gives him the Dragon Ball. Though surprising for the richest man in the world, he asks for only one thing in return, 
explaining that he's been watching the scarred man's entertaining visit to his company through the cameras, and revealing he has no real use for the wishing orb. He studied it pretty much all he can, so now it's just sitting in his basement collecting dust, and knowing if the legend is true or not will be easier and safer for someone else to do and simply tell him about later. However, he does offer Bardock a job as his new head of security, in light of how easily and effectively he made his way inside what's supposed to be a very heavily protected building. Honestly intrigued, Bardock decides to think about this once his quest is actually over, since Gine and Gohan did say he needed a job, and one that included fighting would be preferable since it's kinda all he was good at. Though for now, he does need to know what the man wants in payment, to which Dr. Brie smiles and reveals his currently empty box of cigarettes, bumming one off of Bardock before he happily hands over the Dragon Ball. Deciding he's got no real need to rush and may as well join the man for a smoke, Bardock decides to slow down once again as Roshi instructed, and so taking the time to enjoy a token a drink with Dr. Briefs and even meet his wife and one of his children in passing, even giving him a chance to learn about some of the company's interesting looking vehicles. With the saying even musing that it might be kinda cool to give one to Master Roshi and Grandpa Gohan for helping him, seeing as neither old timer knew how to fly, though he could always turn the tables and teach them something for once. In turn, as Bardock and Dr. Brees bond, the Saiyan decides to only explain a little about himself, likely already standing out too much on account of his tail, his power, and lighting his soul smokes with his key. But overall, the briefs are incredibly hospitable, wishing Bardock good luck on his journey, while the family's youngest daughter seems very keen on having Bardock come back and tell if the legend is true or not. Now with four Dragon Balls in his possession, and well able to tell he has to collect way more than just two, Bardock's search is becoming a slight bit easier, their glow growing in a more precise game of hot and cold form, so he can at least pinpoint the direction he's moving in from now on. However, he obviously can't avoid sleep forever, and so eventually, he has to hunker down and find a nice sturdy tree to support himself for a small resting of the eyes. Just enough to get a second wind, Bark decides. However, like clockwork, the nightmare happens once again, though this time not evolving any further, thankfully. With the scarred saying, therefore, trying his best to relax and actually think on what this vision means, what his spirit is trying to tell him. Though, in the end, this kind of self reflection is still a little bit beyond Bardock as he currently is, since on his own with no other interpretations, he concludes that all it means is that he has hell to pay. And so, once waking with even deeper bags under his eyes, Bardock resolves to sleep only when he has finished his quest, and not a second beforehand. And so, moving on again with the rising of the sun, Bardock actually finds another Dragon Ball, a bit further north in a valley. This in fact being the first one he's encountered not in the possession of a human, merely having to gently take it from a family of curious looking macaques, who weirdly don't seem all that afraid of him. Strange that. Usually when Bardock would come across Fauna on foreign planets, they'd instinctually avoid him, though in the end, he simply assumes they think he's a distant cousin, as he has more important things to think of right now. As at this point, closer to his new goal than ever, Bardock laments that he really hopes there aren't many more of these things to find. But that's where we'll be leaving this story off for right now. That's going to wrap up part 3 of Bardock's Family Escaped. I'm actually going to stop apologizing for when I make videos a little shorter than I usually do. I think this acts a little bit better than us because I'm getting videos out a lot quicker now. Though I will explain why I'm not just kind of sprinting through this original Dragon Ball content, or at least this kind of pre-original Dragon Ball content, because a lot of this is supposed to be happening pre p Saga. And that's just because we have a lot of story potential right here that I don't want to squander whatsoever, and even then, a lot of it's probably going to still get passed up because I still have ideas for further into the story that are going to be at least, you know, a year or so from where we are currently in story not a story i think we actually moving at a pretty good pace and i also think that we're kind of developing bardock in a really interesting way um i know i'm probably a little cringy with the whole like oh he's drinking and smoking thing because i'm actually not a cigarette smoker for one thing i smoke something else but i think his vices give some generally interesting different vehicles for personality and characterization that you don't really have in goku since he has no real interest in those things this is also the first part we've had that is only bardock focused and there are going to be a few more of those but there's also going to be a few that are going to focus back on what's happening at grandpa gohan's house during this time as well so as weird as it is to say this might be the current like main story arc until at least part four vibe I'd say. With that said, it's shout out time, and I want to give one to Valerius Vibe, who has provided the large majority of custom art commissions that have been used throughout this series, and also one to Mr. Negative, who's become a pretty big fan of this series, and has already been churning out a lot of fan art and edits of stuff from it. They've both been really cool and a big help, and are making so this story can have a really good and strong visual identity, which I'm so proud of. And aside from them, there's also our super kind channel supporters. Knuckles OX, Crimson Manifesto, JLP, Zach Haji, Pizza15X, Aaron Winters, Norny1998, Chow Pie. Coder SV3, Ronan Charizard, Daniel Smith, Dylan Wolf Dog 31, Infernate Beast 326, J Ray, Johnny, Narku, Omar Cousins, Snow Slash Memes and More, Steven Norton, Taryn, The Shadows, Vegeta What Ifs, Alamancer, B, Lyman Rogers, Omar Muhammad, Echo, Arcane of the Heart, Tay, Inerbrated, John Sullivan, Corporal Atkins, Trent Rouse, Dark Shadows, Pokemon Trainer Cam, River Joy, Elijah Edwards, Mr. Fantastic, Jesus is King, Half an Onion, Andrew Gonzalez, David Spaulding, Lil T910, Joseph Lau, Trainer Rad 164, Luca Reynolds, Baron Stormblade, Ono, Chris 
Macriano, Lily, Simroth, Red Violet, DeAndre, Gerald Smith, John Self, Jacob Whitker, Massive Oak Woodtree, Demon Set, True Trey, Dutch McGee 101, Bruce Boswick, Robert Ostergaard, Illa Cyclops, Craig Scheiman, Jal Madden, Key Music For Real, Ballcore, Zach Eubanks, Crab Trooper 4552, NBA Fan, Courtney Hawkins, Orion 101, Christian Kyler, Dominic Wiltz, Jester DeMille and Demi the Jester, Cyber Samurai, The Story Buster, One Cold Pirate, Ganning 667, Dr. Ember, Chris, Kieran Lightfoot, Ooga Booga, Cure Skywalker, Andre, Chandler Does What Ifs, Monaki Modilla, and J. Ron Miller. You guys do a ton and it really does mean a lot for the channel and me, so once again, as always, thank you so, so much. That's it for my time today though, so be sure to take care of yourselves and the world around you, and as always, go beyond Plus Ultra, and I'll see you guys next time.